Ryan Johnson, now a two-time Oscar nominee. Congratulations. I had to wear my Eat Shit shirt for this occasion. But I love that's it. adapted screenplay for Glass Onion. How did you find out? Uh, I woke up to, to, to exercise in the morning and, uh, and it, I, I, I get to say that cause it's true. It makes me sound like a healthy person, which I'm generally not. Uh, and I had a bunch of really nice texts from friends and I thought, Oh my God. <laughs> so yeah, it was pretty cool. Probably like similar to a lot of the other nominees, I'm guessing. Mm -hmm. Well, you're one of the rare sequels to be nominated alongside the original. So does that mean more than a second nomination for a different film? I mean, it all means a lot. I mean, I don't know it could, if it could mean more than anything else. To me, it's, it's. Uh, I don't know. I feel like when I was when I was growing up watching the Oscars, when people thank the Academy, I pictured like some monolithic like chamber of people in hoods or something. And uh, when when you get in and you realize it's it's your peers and it's the people that it's other writers specifically in this case that. Uh, you're friends with or that you whose work you admire some of your heroes are in there i mean the fact that um yeah the fact that you get kind of a, a pat on the back and uh you did good with this one from them is is, is pretty cool mm -hmm. i'm very excited for the knives out reunion you're going to have with jamie lee curtis and oh my Andrew god <laughs> It's so exciting. <laughs> yeah, we're going to have to, uh, we should we should do a dramatic reading, I think. We should enlist. Yeah, they should just have you guys present. That's, come on. That's a very good idea. That's a really yeah. good idea. Gotta Someone go. will end up dead on stage, though, and then. Exactly. Yeah. That's the start of the third film. Precisely. Mm -hmm. Stephanie Sue is going to have killed Jamie. That's going to be the, that's the intrigue. There we go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she would never. Uh, well, maybe you, you could just have a, a red herring. You could do a completely different type of mystery. Oh God. So, I can yeah. see, see this all coming together. Oh. I can see it all happening. <laughs> well, I love I love Glass mystery. Onion because I love that you just took the a completely different route this time around with the mystery and doing the the double narrative construction. Mm -hmm. um, and I think some fans were maybe expecting the sequel to be another Knives Out. So how how did you approach this and and just doing a, a different type of mystery for this one? Yeah, to me that that's what's exciting about about making these things. That's why I'm actually so excited right now just starting on the third one is um the notion of truly almost in a scary way for me making them completely different every time. And um that goes back to Agatha Christie for me. That's kind of what she did with her books. Um I think people who kind of have just a general knowledge of Christie think that she did the same thing over and over. The reality is anyone who knows her work, it was the opposite. So I'm just trying to emulate that. And that means it's going to be a different creative challenge every time. It's going to feel a little bit like, oh, wow. Um, especially if the last one connected with audiences and worked, what the hell are we doing, breaking it and doing something different. But to me, that's the only, you know, that's why that that's, that's the only thing that's really worth doing and, and thankfully daniel's on the same page you know yeah definitely um did, did you have any i don't know maybe reservations about uh just doing that whole twist and doubling back and having that reveal and i guess you know fans are not solving it live so to speak like the first one yeah major reservations although i mean with the first one i kind of did it was very different but i also did something to short circuit fans trying to solve it live, which was kind of the false reveal of Anna de Armas's character, um, uh, having done it in the beginning. And to me, that's that's actually kind of a, a feature and not a bug um, in that when I watch a whodunit and I'm the biggest whodunit fan in the world, after about 20 minutes of clue gathering, I kind of that part of my brain kind of disconnects. And I think I'm never going to figure this out. I'm just waiting for the detective to solve it at the end. So for me, telling the audience in a straightforward way, don't worry, the entertainment value of this movie is not going to be some notion that it's a puzzle box you can actually solve by the end of it, but we're going to give you this fun story to follow along with instead. And then, and as like a little bonus thing, it is a mystery the whole time and you get that payoff still, but with the narrative engine of it, giving them something else, uh, something else to kind of drive them along. Yeah, I'm kind of the same way because I when I used to read the clue books when I was a kid, I would turn to the end of the chapter and find out the killer and then I would read the chapter yeah. and look for the clues. I don't try Devious. to solve a mystery. 
<laughs> that's a good way of solving it though that's i mean look that's the best way of solving it. the yeah. thing is though, that's it's funny like that's uh <clears throat> not to not to hop to another topic but just like that exactly what you describe is the how catch them formula which i'm doing in the show poker yeah. face right now so there there is definitely a brand of mystery that does that and i i also i i, I sympathize with that i think that that's to me the um a good mystery never hinges on the notion that the entertainment value is going to be in solving it. It's always entertaining in and of itself. And it's fun that it all comes together in a way you didn't expect. Yeah, Because otherwise you, you're just not going to rewatch it ever. Because after I saw this, yeah. onion, I was like, I cannot wait to watch this again and look for all the clues in the first half <laughs> of the movie. <laughs> that's a, That's the other thing for me is like, it makes it a movie instead of just a puzzle, you know, a crossword puzzle. I do the crossword puzzle every day. I'm never going to go back and redo a crossword puzzle. You know, the, the notion of it's solved and then it's finished um you know that's that's a certain type of pleasure but that's that's not what i want to spend several years of my life <laughs> making one of <laughs> uh well i love just the whole concept and the metaphor of the glass onion and all your clues hiding in plain sight in the first half and then when you do rewatch it you see all the things like miles switching the drink the yeah. the speck of red in the envelope <laughs> i actually when i watched it the first time i clocked benoit not opening the box himself in the beginning because oh he, nice kind of like ah. uh, are they really dead because we didn't see the dead body i love it oh that's great so, I, I guess so like just from writing directing and also in the edit how how did you go about planting enough clues but did you want yeah. audiences to pick up on it during the first watch like those little things like that i i felt like the the, the way to do it is just to be really really fair and just put it all in there, but at the same time, not put emphasis on it. And then in my mind, if audiences do pick up on any, and first of all, I doubt that the notion that audiences, even if you clock like that or other little things, the idea that they'll jump ahead to, oh, she must have a twin who actually hired him. Like that's pretty unlikely. So I, I felt pretty sure that the audience wasn't going to be ahead of that midpoint reveal. And so anything that the audience feels like they clock and store in their brain for later is fantastic in my mind, because that means that's going to hit that pleasure center at the end when he reveals it. And for me, I watch a movie like that. I catch something like that. I feel like a genius and it makes me feel great. And so if I can make the audience feel like a genius, then then that's, you know, then you're you're getting. I, I did feel side. like a genius when I was like, we didn't see him open the box, but I also like you were just saying, I, I forgot about it while I was watching the first hour. <laughs> well, that's the yeah. other, that's the other hope is that we make it. So, you know, you're, I'm trying to have the audience have so much fun. They forget they're supposed to be solving something. That's the ultimate kind of like goal, the ultimate trick. Um, and to use humor to hide the clues. Uh, that's the other kind of uh, ace up our sleeve with these movies, I guess. Mm -hmm. Well, for the, the, drink switching scene in particular because it's kind of obscured by Kate Hudson twirling and her dress so was there mm -hmm. um in shooting it what did you have that like specifically shot listed out like did you want it the the dress to twirl in a certain way to block it enough that you don't see the switch completely like how much of that did you want to show oh my god that was a whole so it was in the script very specifically with the dress and then everything from the design of the dress with jenny egan the fit that's the whole reason that dress looks like that is for that one moment and then on set uh we must have done a poor poor edward and kate who had to keep spinning uh we must have done like 40 takes of that because it's like fishing because the dress isn't going to do the same thing every moment and we wanted to get that perfect take where it was visible but the dress is doing just enough in front of it so uh, yeah a lot went into that moment because because it is sort of um i don't know it's something that uh it, you're kind of you know throwing darts from a moving car a little bit when you're filming it but you want to hit that bullseye mm-hmm and how deep did the discussions go about the how large the speck of red would be? In that was something actually spec. that like, yeah, that was something that uh, that uh, Rick Heinrich, our production designer, and I kind of discovered because we looked at he had made the frame with the Fibonacci sequence kind of outline. And at first we were going to have like the whole envelope behind it. So the whole thing was going to be red. And we looked at it and we're just like, that's so obvious. We can't this. They're going to guess they're going to see it immediately. 
And and I we kept saying, okay, what if we just do it here? What if we just do it in this box? And then I I I spotted that tiny little thing in the center. I said, like, could we get away with this? And we all started like giggling. We were all really excited about it. So that was just a discovery when we were kind of playing with the prop and figuring out how are we how are we going to make this work? You know. Mm -hmm. I do love that speaking of tricks, like the movie is not actually trying to trick you because like you you are laying everything out in front of yeah. us. Um, but I was like one of my friends who who liked the movie, but she was sort of disappointed that she figured out that it was uh, Edward Norton. It was Miles from the beginning. Right. She right. she clocked his malaprops in breathing. Oh, wow. was, like, All right. that's not a word. Like <laughs> <she's> dumb. <laughs> but then she was like, oh, I, I, was, I was hoping to be wrong. Yeah. So but I thought like, you know, you're just leaning into mystery tropes because like it's the most obvious suspect or it's like twins. It is. It's it's also specific. I mean, the Edward thing, it's specific to this movie in terms yes. of um you burning know, the I rich mean, and well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and thematic thematically, the notion of you know, and I guess that's what it came back to is like um uh, the idea that if we're I'm really committing to the glass onion metaphor of you can see right through the middle of it the whole time. And the only way you'll be wrong about this is if you fool yourself and kind of double bluff yourself out of seeing the obvious. Um, and it's kind of just like, okay, well, we're going to commit to that then. And, um, you know, it, 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 a side effect of that might be that there are certain people like your friend who sounds like a genius to me. Uh <laughs> <laughs> who are going to guess it, but then, you know, then, then uh, hopefully there's some degree of pleasure she got from, from having, yeah, I was right. like, you should feel smart. It's like, you picked up on it because <laughs> exactly. that was, yeah, that was part of Ben Wall solving it. Right. So yeah, totally, yeah. totally, totally. So oh. yeah, I mean, but yeah, but that was kind of specific to this movie, I think. Yeah. So what other malaprops did you consider besides in were, and infraction well, point? Infraction yeah. point. There were a bunch. Edward pitched like 30. <laughs> Every single scene, I think he was pitching a different like dumb word. I was just like, I don't think we want to overcook this. <laughs> but he had he had a lot of really, really good ones. And I think we had, yeah, I think we had a couple that were uh <laughs> I think we had a, a couple that um that we actually did shoot that actually like stripped out a bit. But I, I can't remember them at the moment. I'm you need to release not a genius. Cut. I know we have a super cut of all the malapropisms. It's Netflix, yeah. I, I, w I am notoriously bad at doing exactly that at like saying the wrong word, like <laughs> saying it's a, you know, it's a. It's circumspective evidence. Circumspect yeah. Or saying like, it's of tantamount importance to me when I mean like paramount important, you know, it's if so, and, and uh, Steve Yedlin, my cinematographer and I, when we were like in our twenties and made like a phony baloney production company for ourselves we called it malaprop productions yes. because i did that so often so that's a little a little self that's self the backstory um yeah. i one of my favorites is when people say tenant when they mean tenant tenant like tenant yeah. like belief versus tenant like a, a like an apartment tenant ah, a tenant yeah. it's a basic tenant of it it's yeah. a subtle one too, because that end kind of glides into. Yeah, if you, it if you speak into. quickly, but it's more in so in writing when when people yeah. do it, you know. My wife and I have been watching Jeopardy every night. We've gone back to that as a routine, and Ken Jennings is amazing in the way he can hear if someone misses one vowel in their pronunciation of something, and he goes like, "No." <laughs> no like he's a hard ass. He's a <laughs> total hard. Right, he's great at it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, both films uh, have timely or maybe in this one accidentally timely messages but yeah. you never get too preachy with it and the movies are still fun and entertaining like you've said and I guess how do you find that sweet spot where you do want to skewer something but mm -hmm. not be so boxy about it well I, I I think that you know first and foremost with these movies we I just I focus on making them grand entertainments and I think that's that's the number one thing is it it's it's a machine and for the machine to be running, it has to be entertaining the audience just moment to moment. I think if you have your focus on that, um, that helps a lot. And then, I don't know, for me, it's it's also, um, I think the form of the whodunit helps to, uh, that was one of the things I was really excited about with with doing whodunits set in modern day America and throwing away, away the notion of timelessness and saying, okay, no, let's use this to kind of, um, 
trying to kind of, you know, laugh at and argue about and discuss a lot of the things we're discussing now, because I think the form of the whodunit is uniquely good at that. It it necessitates by its very structure a group of suspects who form a little microcosm of society. And um, and within that, it's this amazingly per- perfect tool for kind of examining society as a, as a whole and kind of saying things about it, but totally within the structure of an entertaining mystery. Um, so I think the, the form itself kind of helps very much in that regard. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think you're also really great on just throwing in these gags, like, Jared Leto's kombucha and Jeremy Renner's hot sauce, <laughs> which they, they need to be real. But how did you pick them? Or were there other celebrities uh, did you guys discuss and they just didn't I want their know. names associated? <laughs> no, but I mean, both of those guys were, were super cool. And, and uh, you know, and and also I'm just, I, it, it helps, I guess I'm fans of both of those guys. I think they're both awesome. So, um, so yeah, I don't know. I, I, I would totally buy <laughs> Jared Leto's hard kombucha. I would. I, I, I love spicy food, so I need running hot to be You're running hot. I think, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, you you mentioned before Poker Face, uh, your new case of the week mystery. Uh, I love that you're you brought back mysteries to film, and now you're doing Colombo style mysteries on TV <laughs> with Natasha Leone. But I, I I guess like how did you uh, how, how did you go about bringing this format? back when it's it's more episodic storytelling when yeah. um you know in this era of peak tv it's been so heavily serialized too yeah we just kind of held our breaths and did it i mean that that's the thing i just i missed the i missed that specific joy of almost the comfort food of the truly episodic kind of procedural, I guess, you know, the word procedural now is, is so associated with the network procedurals, which, um, you know, which, which do their thing and they're terrific. But, um, the notion of an hour long, really high quality, like mystery drama centered around an incredibly charismatic character that has the same structure every time. So in a way it's almost more like the pleasures of a sitcom. You're coming back to kind of hang out with, somebody that you like and get a new pleasure within the same structure that you're used to every single time. Um, I missed that. I just kind of missed it. I love, there's so much great serialized TV, but the notion of kind of cutting against the grain a little bit and going back to pure episodic, um, it felt worth trying and seeing if we do a really great version of it, will people tune in for this? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I like, I like waiting week to week Mm, back in the day. So I know, yeah. totally. Although I was, so many of them I watched was reruns. And so it was, yeah. and that's another nice thing about it. It's like every day there'd be a new one, but it's not like they're playing them in order, you know? Mm-hmm. So it would be hopping all around. Or you'd see the same the one like two weeks apart and you're like, Completely. Okay. Yeah. 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 Exactly. So, uh, yeah. But I also it, thought it, it was, it was funny because you, obviously you worked on Breaking Bad and you directed one of their standalone bottle episodes, Fly, um, right. highly divisive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah that's right that, that was still a standalone but then your other one ozymandias which is 10 years old this year yeah. is insane wow is that. it oh my god yeah time, time is a flat circle i know and that one is like obviously heavily serialized because that was towards the end yeah they're very much opposites in that regard yeah nothing happens in fly and everything happens in ozymandias <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um so what can you share about the third film uh, I am just starting to fish for ideas right now. I mean, the reality is between putting out Glass Onion and now putting out and finishing Poker Face, I've been, <laughs> my head has been in a lot of other places. It feels really, really good now to just kind of have a breath and kind of be uh, alone in rooms with my notebook, just starting to kind of think. But what I can say is what's exciting to me is the notion of doing something completely different than Glass Onion and completely different than Knives Out. Um going someplace that we haven't gone before and uh yeah trying to surprise myself so do you have any see. title ideas because you you went to the Beatles for this yeah. one I feel like I need the thing is I uh, I have a couple but I really need to land on what the thing is and what it's about that's mm-hmm. the thing it's like that kind of comes first and then unless uh and I've been leaving my music library on random lately hoping that just some amazing song comes up and I'm like oh that's the title uh so maybe that'll happen we'll see we'll we'll see what the itunes movie gods do 
And then you call Netflix to clear I call Netflix. Exactly. the credits. I that. mean, look, we've cleared the Beatles song at this point. No they one's can afford gonna, it. It's fine. No so. one's going to blink. It's fine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> can I pitch a film that doesn't have to be the third film? But please just do. Future? My God, please do. So I love tennis. Yeah. And obviously, Ben Rob Blanc, he solved the case with the tennis champ. You had That's Serena right. Williams in Glass Onion. Can we get a prequel film about the tennis case? Oh my God. I mean, that's pretty cool. So that's actually, that's a reference. It's kind of like a double layered reference. One of my favorite films is Sleuth, which Mm -hmm. is based on the Anthony Schaffer play um, with uh, Michael Caine and Laurence Olivier. And the beginning of that film, Olivier, who is a mystery writer, is like dictating the end of his of his latest novel and he's describing a, a murder in the tennis yeah. court where like he throws the body into the middle of the tennis court so there are no footprints but i th- i believe i haven't read the book i think that itself is a reference to a john dixon car novel with gideon fell as the detective um that's a tennis thing so that's kind of like a multi i could get sued by multiple people is what i'm saying if i <laughs> It's okay. We're that... gonna get started on this now. We'll contact okay. the states. Excellent. Perfect. Get it. Get, we'll, get, get we'll, it going. You know, we'll get train. The I mean, I'm going. sure Daniel can play tennis. Like he's been doing Wimbledon, <laughs> so it's it's fine. Well, and then we have the ballerina, the the case with That's the ballerina. True. That could the be the Catherine other one. References. Here we go. Yeah. There I, you go. Yeah. So. <laughs> we have so many ideas. Yeah. Yeah. The exactly. One's gonna start with the murder at the Oscars. So put them on the wall. I can see it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, Ryan, it was great speaking with you. Thanks so much for your time and congratulations again on everything. Joyce, thank you so much. Appreciate it. 